This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Detroit is the greatest! Straight up light you on fire for a Coney dog right now. Welcome to the Motor City Sports Rant on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I am Jason Jarvie. Follow me on Twitter at Jarvie the King. And with me, as always, is my friend and my co-host, John the Doc Macaroon. How's it going, sir? I want to apologize to you, Jason. I know that I try to get you on the Lions bandwagon. I try to get you excited for the Detroit Lions. And what do they do? They in a game where they drop a game, in a game where they're supposed to go out and dominate Houston, they go out there and they don't perform that well, and they come away with a loss. A couple head scratching decisions that I know we're going to talk about, but I want to apologize. I'm sorry. You know what? You can't get on the Lions bandwagon because it's just too hard. There's no, no, there's no reason to apologize, John. And I don't really consider myself a bandwagon Lions fan. I'm always a Lions fan. I am a realistic fan. Now, you you were trying to get me to be more positive about what they're doing. And I still think that there are positive things about this team. And that's why I, I've, I've always said it, that the Lions and the Tigers are almost in identical situations where they do have talent on their team, but they're consistently killed by their coach. Exactly. We're in a phase now in Detroit sports where you got Stan Van Gundy, who's widely regarded as a solid basketball mind. He's doing things that arguably are solid fundamentally. He's building a team. They're playing fundamentally sound basketball, and you're starting to see some results with the Pistons. But everywhere else, with Jeff Blaschel, with... Um, it's still working out for them. They're 6-4. They're and four. It's, it's not, not that bad. bad. It's not bad, but you can still argue regarding some line combinations, who's been sitting out. The And to the Red Wings' point, a lot of it has to do with upper management and who they're bringing in and, and things like that. But Brad Ausmus, Jim Caldwell specifically, you think that, and I would think that, the Lions would be farther along. They would not be 4-4 four and four if there was somebody else in charge of the Lions. And that's what everyone is so pissed off about, is that there's a couple losses that are inexcusable that I believe that if they had a solid, fundamental head coach that knew how to call games in game within that 60 minute within the confines of the 60 minutes if he knew how to run and call the correct plays and not make boneheaded mistakes I believe this is a six and two football team there's no way you go to Chicago and lose and there's no way that you fall apart versus the Tennessee Titans those are two wins right there that you could argue were the result of some some coaching errors and some mistakes fundamentally the team not ready to perform I totally agree and there, you can't discount, and I, I was, I was hard on the Lions a couple of weeks ago. I, I will admit that, and I think you, you finally are starting to see that they are suffering on defense from injuries. That Terrell Austin, he may not have the best game plan, but he also has, he has very little to work with. He, he, he barely has any linebackers. He's consistently losing his, his defensive line. He, we played without our. Our only actual NFL caliber defense or cornerback in this last game, and Darius Slay, he was out. So they're they're severely limited on there. And and really, what it's come down to is that if if Matthew Stafford isn't playing uh, up to the level that he he can, they're not going to win. And uh, and you know what? He may have actually been playing up to the level in this game because he wasn't making bad mistakes. He the the Texans were pressuring him, and they could have been in a situation where you're you're talking about tying the game up, maybe going to overtime, and then him getting another comeback victory in the fourth quarter. But because Jim Caldwell, I'm not sure if he's making the wrong decision, but what he's doing is that he's putting his players in very poor positions. Like How- the the onside kick. Might not, you know. I think it's it. It could be a toss up. You could get it. I think there's. It's almost like a fifty fifty chance. But 
if you if you kick it and you rely on your te- on your defense, then you know you you're at least instilling confidence in your team. You're telling them, hey, you I believe in you that we have all of our timeouts and that we can we can get this game we can get the ball back. See what everyone is upset about is it seems like Jim Caldwell and the coaching staff isn't looking at what everyone else is looking at, and they they try to act like the smartest guys in the room. What was Houston doing at the end of the game? They were just running the ball straight into the line. They made it known to you. They told everybody, hey, listen, we're going to go conservative. We don't want Brock Osweiler, the guy that we supposedly signed for a big money deal, to waste this opportunity. They were not going to be aggressive at that point in the game. So you're telling me that you didn't think that you could use your three timeouts knowing that they were just going to run the ball basically right up the middle? So to say that the onside kick was the right thing to do is is really silly in that, okay, let's just say statistically that it is the right play to, to, to make. And it isn't based on, you know, stats and things like that, that you only have basically a 10% chance of recovering an onside kick these days. But let's just say that it is statistically correct. You think the Lions are really going to go out there and execute an onside kick, basically showing that formation? No. Houston was right there, and it was poorly executed. I mean, Sam Martin kicked the ball basically right to the Houston defender. And right then and there, you give up and you basically send the message to the defense that we have no confidence in you, and it ended up being the wrong play because you didn't execute. So to come out there and to say that we do it all the time and sometimes it turns out good and sometimes it turns out bad, it's a bad coaching error, and Rob Rubick from Fox Sports Detroit came out and said, this is egregious. You cannot do that. The proper play is to kick the ball off and rely on your defense. So what is Jim Caldwell and his staff trying to do? I understand you want to be aggressive, and I like the fact that they're going for it more on fourth down, but in that situation, it was the wrong call, and it basically cost you the victory, uh, um, uh, among a myriad of other reasons. And you know, with Jim Caldwell, what's tough is, and what is upsetting to a lot of fans, and the reason why a lot of people come down on him harder than a lot of other coaches, is that he comes out and blatantly basically lies to us and insults my intelligence. You cannot come out the next day when you know you're going to be asked about it. Okay, why did you go out there and kick the onside kick? And then you're asked about your defense. Well, do you have confidence in your defense? And he comes out and says, we, I think the defense is trending upward. If the defense is trending upward, why the hell are you not giving them a chance to just make a couple of stops to get the ball back? Now, needless to say, you're still down seven. You still had, you know, you, you still were going to need to go down the field and score a touchdown, but you basically took the game away from Matthew Stafford's hands. And he was the guy that week in, week out, was giving you the best chance. Why Why do that? And why insult the intelligence of the fans when you could just be honest and just say, the defense is struggling, they're going to struggle. I didn't believe they had an opportunity to stop them, so I made the move and it didn't work out. That's on me. That's a much more uh, you know fair answer and one that's a little bit easier to take. But to come out and you know kind of say that you believe in that defense, it's a little bit tough to take. So, I mean, regardless, even if they, so they didn't get the onside kick, you still had the opportunity on defense if you did trust yeah. your defense, you still had a chance to, you had all three timeouts, but, you know, first down, they get three yards. Second down, they get a first down. And you they get another first down on top of that. So, it, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like he's been lionized. I don't think he, he can't run this team. I think it, any, any more success we have the rest of the season it's going to be based solely on the performance of our players. We don't have a coach that's going to go out and win us games. Bill Belichick goes out and he wins games for his team. He game plans during the week uh, of what should happen. Bruce Arians of the Arizona Cardinals, he can go in at halftime and make adjustments. The good coaches can make adjustments and they make the right calls. They argue when there's something that they feel can give them an advantage in the game. Like you look at the the fumble that they didn't oh they they didn't want to challenge for on DeAndre Hopkins and the reason that they didn't challenge is because Jim Caldwell wanted all of his timeouts he was so afraid that he was going to lose the challenge that he he just didn't and he just accepted that the that this this fumble didn't get overturned or it's something that probably could have been overturned so Jim Caldwell shouldn't he really shouldn't be <laughs> The, the head coach of this team. And I, th- I think realistically, that was why I was probably so upset a couple of weeks ago is that we win in spite of our coach. And if we do keep winning, then it's more than likely that 
Jim Caldwell is going to get an extension. If we somehow make it into the playoffs, Jim Caldwell is more than likely going to get an extension. And there's absolutely no reason for the same reason because it's not on him. It's the players. Matthews, if Matthew Stafford's going to have an MVP caliber year if we get into the playoffs. It makes it hard to root for the Lions week in, week out, knowing that there are they are going into games with a disadvantage. You know, game management is it, it you would think that at this point in time, when you hired a you know, a late game strategist and Randy Etzel, you would think that the Lions would make some progressions in that. And they just don't seem to be at that level. And you feel like, okay, Jim Caldwell has strengths in terms of keeping a locker room together. He has strengths in terms of being a leader. But in between, you know, when the game starts from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., he just doesn't have it. And it's hard to watch each week going, man, I'm rooting for this team because that was a, an opportunity to go 5-3 and three to get an opportunity to get to the postseason. You're telling me you're going to get six wins in the next, you know, you might the rest not of the way? get six wins. I mean, you. I think five wins puts you in a very good position to be in contention for the wild card. I think four wins, you really, you really need to hope for everybody else to suck. But I think, you know, to go five and three, they don't have a, you know, a brutal schedule the rest of the way. They, I think, when we when we looked at the schedule before, I think there were games that looked harder that aren't as hard anymore because now we're facing, we have two games against the Vikings in the next three games, which if you would have talked to me about three weeks ago, I would have said that there's no way that we can go up against the Vikings and have a hope of winning. But the Vikings have been, the Vikings have been pretty non-existent the last couple of games. They've been exposed. They, and they don't have an offense. They, they need to shut you down on their defense. So there's the possibility there that we could, take at least one of those games from the Vikings. You know, we're playing the Jaguars, who are a mess. The Saints are a mess. The Bears, even though that they, you know, unless they have some super resurgence by Jay Cutler, they're not that, you know, they're not intimidating. Then you get the Giants, Cowboys, and Packers, who I think there's a chance. To win five games out of these next eight, it's not unheard of. That's not, you know, I agree 100%. Obviously, but, it, but you want to get a win, though, this next game. It's, it's, we're almost at a must-win situation because if you, if you start, lose another game, then it's just going to be we're on the downslide again. We're now in the midst of another two- or three- or four-game slide. And to the point that you made, you said it yourself. Wasn't Houston's weakness in the secondary? Wasn't their weakness in terms of pass defense? And then you've seen that the Lions were so stubborn that they wanted to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball with Theo Riddick, and it wasn't as effective as in the past. You thought with Theo Riddick coming back, you thought with Eric Ebron coming back, even though he had around, what, seven catches, 79 yards, you thought that that those guys coming back would allow your offense to play better, and it just didn't work out. You had situations where Houston was pressuring Matthew Stafford. They did some things, and Houston was able to stop Golden Tate and the screen game. And once that was not established as much, it just seemed like the creativity on the Lions' offensive side was non existent. And I blame this performance, you know, as much on Jim Caldwell as I do, I blame a lot of it on the offensive scheme by Jim Bob Cooter. He neutered Matthew Stafford. So I, I want to. I will say though, I think you have that actually backwards because Houston. I think in the Lions may they made a mistake by trying to go too much. They looking at stats and going on it because statistically, if you look at Houston, actually does have one of the best passing defenses, but they also have conversely one of the worst rushing defenses. They were bad on the rush side. So. They, and they couldn't even execute that. Exactly. Oh, they, man. They, they, they saw the stats, and they're like, okay, with Theo Riddick and Dwayne Washington and Zach Zenner, we can gash this team. And they were so it – it's like the Spartans. I, it's, I hate <laughs> – all, all of my favorite teams are just um, uh, just a big ball of suck, and they're all connected somehow. They're, they're so stuck in their game plan that they have, they don't change it. This is a passing team. Even if the the game plan was dictated towards rushing the ball and trying to to get that weakness to exploit that weakness, you should have then gone to the pass. And that's all I said during the game was throw, take a chance once a quarter, throw the ball deep. It just seemed like they were so reliant on this 
you know, dink and dunk passing offense. I get it that it's conservative. You limit the turnovers, but take a chance a couple times. You have to open up that defense a little bit. When if you exactly like if you, like you said, when you go into a game, you start noticing a trend in the game. You start noticing that you're not running the ball effectively. Why are you still going to it? Over and over and over again. Why are you not trying to throw the ball deep to Marvin Jones? Why are you not trying to? I do. I understand they like Golden Tate on these running passes, or they like Golden Tate on these running plays. They like to kind of mix things up. But Golden Tate's a solid receiver. He can get open if he goes out and and does at least a dig route, fifteen yards. Try it. So I'd like to know who then whose call was that? I think everything good that goes on with the offense, you would like to say it's Jim Bob Cooter. But everything bad, I think it always gets heaped onto Jim Caldwell. So where I don't, I don't think it's 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 always. I think it's somewhere in the middle. So I mean, is is Jim Bob Cooter? Does he not have the power to change up his offense? Is do I mean? Obviously, they went into the week with a game plan of trying to run the ball, try to turn to go and get all these short passes. Where Matthew Stafford is. He's a gunslinger, and the short passes and the safe passes have worked. But when we need to get back in games, we will open it up and we'll go down the field. So is this Jim Bob Cooter, or is it Jim Caldwell saying, you know what, we're going to continue doing what we're doing because we have we have a process, and this is what, you know, we, again, we're the smartest guy in the room. We're going to keep running until we it actually works. No, the final call always goes with Jim Caldwell because he's the head coach. But you obviously understand that he's relying heavily on Jim Bob Cooter and Terrell Austin to do their job effectively. It just wasn't the pro- it wasn't the proper you know scheme to run. And when the again, what we see as always is when halftime comes is when you see teams make adjustments. You notice, okay, in the first half we're not going that well. We're not scoring a ton of points. Then you come out in the second half, you go, oh, okay, let's change it up a little bit. Let's try some things new. No, it's more of the same, more of the same. And that's why in situations where they've played well, they've had the effective game plan and they've gone out and executed. In a game like that, that first half performance would dictate to you that, oh, we got to make some changes up and do some things differently. And yet they didn't do it more of the same. And, you, and it resulted in you being behind the, the the entirety of the game. There were way too many situations where you could have had a lot more productive plays. And it just sucked that, you know, with the with guys coming back, that you didn't score more points against this Houston team. And I know it's tough to win on the road, but it just didn't seem like the rhythm was there for the offense. It didn't seem like the effectiveness was there this week. And it, it's just baffling knowing what you just saw. Teams usually don't play that well after playing on Monday night. It just seemed like... Houston was ready to go a lot more, and they just the Lions came out with a, a really terrible performance. And again, the momentum plays that you could have maybe had, that turnover that you could have gotten, that whole situation with the flag was really, really interesting in that immediately the Lions came out and said, we got, we got word from the league that they wouldn't have overturned it. I still think it's worth trying to throw the flag and see. I mean... It, 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 you don't you know you don't have you have zero chance of getting it if you don't throw the flag and you saw Caldwell you know which, which is why I don't blame him a whole heck of a lot and that he is relying on others to give him that information but it just stinks that you he doesn't know that okay if there's a situation where we can have a momentum changing play throw the flag even if the if your staff is telling you hey no no throw it, it look close enough did I mean didn't it look like to you just on the eye test that Hopkins took two steps and lost the football. Yeah. It, I mean, it's unbelievable that the league and the refs didn't just call it a fumble so you can get the replay. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And there is breaking news. I heard. Breaking news per uh, Adam Schefter, Michael Rothstein. The Lions are trading a 2018 seventh-round pick to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for cornerback Jonathan Banks. Woo-woo. So we get another big corner to go opposite of Darius Slay whenever he comes back. And they made move. They made a move. I know a lot of people were wondering why they didn't make a move for the linebacker from New England, but you, you don't want a guy that people kind of know doesn't play hard. So, And if Cleveland wanted him, you know you made the right play not uh, not getting him. Please. New England knows what's going on. They know two, there are two, three, four moves ahead. And if they if they if if you thought that you were going to trade Kyle Van Noy for a value, please. You had to. You, did you believe that the... The Lions fans are so desperate that they're willing to take a guy that's known as being lazy and inconsistent and put him on your team, and he gets he ends up being on Cleveland. Listen, I know that the Lions need linebacker help, but you're going to probably find it through the draft. 
you're not going to go out and get uh, – refresh my memory, who is it? Um, the, the gentleman that was uh, – the linebacker that was traded to Cleveland for the third-round pick. Oh, Jamie Collins. Jamie Collins. People are uh, clamoring for him. I know the Lions need linebacker help, but not See, that guy. And that the thing is, is the, the this trade you make, if Jonathan Banks can actually come in – and be a pretty good Solid. and be a pretty good compliment to to Darius Slay. The where wherever you improve the defense, if you improve the defensive line, that helps the cornerbacks. If you help if you improve the cornerbacks, you're going to help the defensive line because one of the issues why guys can just stand there and shred our defense is because if they if they have enough time, they're going to be able to expose Guys like Quandre, Quandre Diggs and Nevin Lawson and Jonathan Bottomosi. You know, if we can actually have a semblance of a of a defensive back unit, they're going to take away the they're going to take away receivers, and it's going to give time to our linemen to get to the quarterback to to break up plays, and if not sack them, to at least put them under pressure and have more bad throws. And there's you know reports coming out. A lot of people are buzzing us on Twitter at Detroit Podcast that he played alongside that he played alongside Slay in college. So there's an opportunity there to reunite. And it didn't seem like that it, a minimal cost for a guy that was a former second round pick. You know, the Lions are trading 2018 seventh round pick for a cornerback. So it's not that much to give up. And yeah, you, it's you, a you, smart move. I mean you yeah. gotta improve that defense. So But now I want to ask you this. I know you were watching that game and I had made a joke and, and jokingly said it at the time because it started out you know, a situation where you started watching the game and boom, a flag is thrown. A nice play happens, a flag is thrown. And at that point, you go, what's going on here, dude? This is this is similar to the same old Lions. Whenever there's a solid play, there's a flag being thrown. Then it was pointed out that was the exact same crew that threw the 29 flags earlier in the year. How yeah. in the world, Jason, is that possible that you get two of the worst, shittiest uh, officiating crew in the league and their ref- it just is so disappointing. Yeah, that- I think the Freep actually had a stat that it's disappointing. This, this crew had the second most penalties called. It's unbelievable, Jason, that, okay, why is it that the Lions get stuck with these officiating crews that are subpar and they're horrible? It ruins the flow of the game. And everybody's talking about, you know, you know talking about the Lions and their effectiveness aside. They have no chance to win if, if, if the officiating crew is not going to be on their side and they're going to make calls, holding calls, and, and, and it breaks up the momentum, it breaks up the flow of the game, and people are wondering why you know football is a tough watch nowadays. Not only is it frustrating when you have a score, you go to commercial, you come back for the kickoff, you go to another commercial. So it's basically like 10 minutes of commercials for four seconds of football action. And then you got the officiating crew that comes into the game and ruins the flow of the game is just unacceptable on so many levels. Why is it that the Lions get stuck with this situation, you know, time in, time out, year in, year out? It's not right. And it just, I know they don't want to blame the officials, but that officiating crew ruined the watching experience. They ruined the watching experience that day for sure. Yeah, and I just, I'm not sure if there's a, some sort of formula, the way that they break them up, if it's just even or, I mean, the one thing that you could point to is that maybe because the Lions aren't the the high-profile team, they aren't, you know, the Denver Broncos or the, I don't know, the Seattle Seahawks or the Arizona Cardinals, that we do get the lesser than officiating crews. If, if that's actually how, if they go by, hey, we have America's Game of the Week, we're going to put the best official crew on there and then basically divvy up everybody else, I mean that's that's kind of true. You're you have two not so great teams, Lions and Texans. Who cares who who you put on there then? And I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I don't know how they select the officials. Um, but yeah, uh, tough tough there watch. Just, there just needs to be better officiating. It, yeah, across the board. Yeah. So I don't know. So the rest of the season, where we have a bye after next week, I think. Right. Mm-hmm. So. We'll be Maybe not- get some guns back. Maybe that'll be with Haloti Nada coming back. Maybe a sighting of DeAndre Levy. Dude, Maybe De- Ziggy Ansah. We're never going to see DeAndre. DeAndre Levy is done playing football. I bet he never plays football again. You think so? You I'm still- not going to make a, a, a food bet on that one. That's just uh, 
that's a pessimistic lion. That, that's a truly pessimistic lion fan take right there that we're never going to see uh, DeAndre Levy again. Just because, or if he comes back, how effective is he even going to be this year? It's just one of those things where you go, man, that defense. Um, do you believe what Caldwell says is that, you know, the defense is trending upward? I don't see it. I see a defense that I know everyone is looking at them as a bend, 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 don't break kind of defense, but they just don't seem aggressive enough. There are guys that are making plays here and there, but it's just not consistent enough collectively as a unit to really give you confidence that they're going to do some things. Like like most people going into this game Sunday versus um, Minnesota kind of feel like Sam Bradford's going to pick them apart. I think it's hard to trend upward when you have so many injuries. I mean, trending upwards means you have guys coming back. Ziggy Anza is playing at a Pro Bowl level that you have a guy like DeAndre Levy who could come in and do some stuff for your team, be a leader for your defense. We don't have that. We have our second and third string guys being in there. We can't even get a, a cohesive defensive line uh, coming in. Our, our The best defensive lineman we have right now playing is Kerry Hyder, who's, what, seventh round, uh, an undrafted guy? So I think it's hard. There's... There's bright spots on the defense. I think to say trending up is basically just coach speak. He's trying to PC time show some faith. It's the it's the canned answer. It's saying, oh yeah, our defense is trending upwards. I'm sure if you went to uh, the Browns press conference, I'm sure they're saying that their defense is trending upwards. I mean, there there's how much worse can you be if you're the Browns? And I think it's a similar situation with the Lions. How much worse can you be? And I think for us, it is a lot worse because we could just be. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much worse we could be because it seems like we're always just giving up points. But on a positive note, Jason, it's nice to see moves being made in the season. You see Kyle Van Noy not performing. Bob Quinn chips him out. You see a need in the secondary. Boom, Bob Quinn goes out, and basically it's a free tryout giving up the, what he gave up to get Jonathan Banks. Uh, he was the number 43 pick in the 2013 draft. Uh, the Lions took Darius Slay seven spots earlier at number 36. So it's a reunion of sorts. So Darius Slay has familiarity with him. And it's basically, yeah, a free tryout because you didn't give up much to get him. And if there's something left in him, hey, then he'll perform well. And I like the fact that if you look at it and everyone's talking about it, Bob Quinn has already done more in one season of moves than, you know, in terms of what he did in the draft and in, the, and in this season than uh, the former regime did in a couple years. So it's nice to see that you kind of got a feeling. And right now I'm still confident that you kind of – have a feeling that Bob Quinn has his finger on the pulse of what's going on around the league. He knows what the players are up to. He kind of has a feeling of who can play and who can't. It's just in his first year, you just have a roster that needs a little bit more depth. That's all. I think the book is going to really be out on Bob Quinn until we get to the post, until we get to the off season. Right. Because you have to see how this team finishes. And I I think his, his hands are really going to be tied. If we, if they somehow manage to make it to the playoffs, He's he's essentially going to be tied to Jim Caldwell, which is unfortunate because I really think he has a chance to to really start building this team the right way, the way that he sees. But if he's still tied to Jim Caldwell, it's just, it's going to continue to drag him down, and we're going to be set back at least another year. So on November first, are you buying or selling on the twenty sixteen Detroit Lions? Four and four, buying or selling. Can I stay in the middle? I don't want to buy or sell. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I'm I'm going to buy just because of Matthew Stafford and what this offense can do. And w- if you have Marvin Jones going, if you have Golden Tate going, you get Theo Riddick in the mix. Maybe Amir Abdullah comes back late. Maybe he's able to give you something. I think based on this offense and if our defense can stay somewhere in the middle of the defenses uh, overall in the league, then I think this team has a chance. And that's me as a fan wanting the team to win. But, you know, wanting Jim Caldwell gone means having to have them lose. And I don't really want to root for them to lose. And I actually see them winning, which is, it's a okay. it's a double-edged sword. That's I, right. I feel like buy I'm, on them. That's right. I, I, I don't think it's a, a terrible decision to buy on the Detroit Lions. Nothing, nothing wrong with that at all. Let's take a quick timeout, come back, and it's post-mortem time regarding the game, the team that we love to support, the Sparties. Uh, they, I guess you could say it's an admirable effort, but I will make an argument that they had a better chance of winning had the uh, coaches got their heads out of their asses for sure.
it didn't look good for either of those teams, really. And we'll discuss that next on the Motor City Sports Rant, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Doc here for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. We're a network of Detroit Sports Podcasts that discuss all things regarding the Lions, Tigers, Red Wings, Pistons, Michigan, Michigan State. We're dedicated to all things Detroit sports, and we want to thank everybody for your continued support. The downloads are through the roof. We greatly appreciate it. And to show your support, all you got to do, visit our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Check out all the podcasts. We have shows running daily. We got specials now with um, the coach of the Detroit Mercy Titans basketball team. Um, The Detroit Sports Podcast Network has earned a credential to cover them, and so we'll be doing a lot more with the Detroit Mercy Titans. You can check out all the shows dedicated to the Lions, the Tigers, fantasy football. If your team is struggling like Jason's is mightily, definitely check out the Fantasy Nerds podcast that airs every Friday. And if you're still in love with Michigan, you're still on board, you think they're going to do great this year, Check out the Justice Report, airs each and every Saturday, dedicated to Michigan athletics. DetroitSportsPodcast.com. We greatly appreciate all your support. Voices of Sports Ramp, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. What'd Sorry. You do, what'd you do for Halloween? I worked at the radio station. As you pilfer all the candy I brought for the kids. I grabbed one dot. You didn't even ask. I don't care. Those are for the young kids that come to get help. I'm young at heart. <laughs> and dots are my favorite. Did you? I read a tweet from Ken Cal, and it's something very interesting in that I kind of noticed it a little bit last year, but this year was different. He had tweeted out that maybe in his entire night of uh, giving out candy, only about 20, 25 kids came. And one lucky cat at the end of the night, because nobody really went to Ken Cal's house and it was kind of slow, he had commented that, man, Halloween kind of is trending downward. And so one kid that came to his house got 20 big Hershey bars at the end of the night in that uh, because nobody came, so people were unloading a bunch of candy. That happened to me and my kids in that towards the end of the night, around 7 o'clock when we were winding down, people had buckets and buckets of candy, and they were just giving them like four or five pieces each because... A lot of people aren't trick or treating, maybe because we did we did it too. In that over the weekend, we did something called a trunk or treat, where yeah. a bunch of friends gather and you just put a bunch of candy in your trunk and design it. And uh, maybe more and more people are are not trusting of the community as yeah, much, and they I, don't trick or treat. I kind of noticed that, and you know, part of it's just me. You know, I I wasn't really in the whole Halloween thing. I don't go. We didn't go to any parties. You know, we're not going out trick or treating with a. Uh, you know, I mean, I could have gone if I didn't work. I probably would have gone with my nieces and nephew. But yeah, it it was kind of odd yesterday. Just kind of the whole day, it didn't really, it didn't feel like Halloween. So I don't know if it was. I do think people are kind of going. It's people are are mistrustful people. I mean, you don't. It, we don't have that open community where everybody just knows everybody and and nowadays. And I think there are still. There's still some patches. Like there's some, there are some really close knit uh, communities where they'll, they'll do that, and I think they do go more towards uh, if it, if it's on like a Monday or Tuesday, they'll have their own Halloween party on on the weekend, and they'll either just ha- do like a block party or yeah, I I mean I even saw Kroger like on I think the Friday before I went there, and they had a whole setup in in the store where you go around. I saw that in mine and too. they had a bunch of different uh, like activities you could do. So it, I mean, you pretty much go anywhere during the Halloween weekend, and they're probably going to be giving away candy. I'm sure you can go to the malls, do all that kind of stuff. So I've, uh, it's definitely changing. It's and it's just a sign. It's a it's sign the of the times. times. Yeah, sign of the times. It's it's tough too because you know it was a little bit colder on Monday than I thought it was going to be, but we enjoyed it. it we it got was, to like, it was fine. I mean, it was I, not bad. I remember going out for Hall- Halloween's are always the worst weather ever. I remember always having to wear a coat over or under my costume. I know a couple times like I was I'd have my costume but it'd be raining, so I'd put on a poncho and my mom would tell me that, "Oh, I'm I'm going on the Maid of the Mist at Niagara Falls." And so that was my costume for a couple of years. You know what was going on in my sub which my wife was like fully endorsing? Uh, a lot of the neighbors in my sub uh, threw out a bonfire and were boozing it up. <laughs> Three, four people at a time drinking and passing out candy. I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on here? But, but you know, in the Midwest, you kind of know, and in, you know, Macomb, people like to drink. They get their drink on. So any opportunity to get a bonfire going, throw some uh, some rum and uh, some Bacardi in your cider, it's not bad. My wife uh, came home and was like, try this. And I was like, ooh, what is this? 
she spiced up my my uh, cider. I was like, damn, girl, good job. I do like a boozy drink, and I'm sure a lot of Bacardi people... Bacardi and cider is, isn't bad. I'm Warm sure it up. a lot Ooh. of people had some boozy drinks on <laughs> Saturday. No doubt about it. When you text me... Uh, twelve fifteen. I was like, "What? What happened? Huh. Seventy five yards opening drive, running the ball effectively." I thought, "Okay, they showed up. Maybe they're gonna play well." And I, and then the next drive, boom, Michigan just went right up and down the field. Their offense showed up for their first drive, and I wasn't. And to be, I'll, I'll give you how I was in the car. I was listening. I'm just like, "This is kind of crazy right now." And I didn't. I didn't go. I didn't blow it overboard because I knew it was gonna be a long game. And we hadn't even seen uh, the Michigan offense and if our defense had come to play. And they obviously didn't. So we all know the final. The, or what was the final score? It was like 32 to 23. So it was just, it's it's our season in a nutshell of not being able to tackle, not being able to score in a timely manner, and just not being able to get the job done. And it seems like all the decisions that have been made by Michigan State haven't turned out right. Whether you put in Lewerke, then you put back in uh, Tyler O'Connor. It just seems all a mishmush of crap. But I will argue that that series where they had the ball at the Michigan 3 and you decide that you want to run the ball. Oh, my God, four straight runs. Four straight runs. I argue you get that touchdown. Now you put more pressure on Michigan and the the tide is turned. Michigan tried to let you back in the game. I mean, uh, Spade threw the interception, a bad interception. You have an opportunity to kind of get back in the game. Four straight runs. And then after, I I don't understand that when people question coaches regarding what they're doing, Mark D'Antonio had the gall to say, listen, we have to win the battle. Michigan's defense is unbelievable. Top ranked in the country. First down, okay, doesn't work. Second down, doesn't work. You try it two more times, you think you're going to win that battle? Nobody in the state of Michigan, I will tell you, Jason, nobody in the entire state of Michigan believed that Michigan State was going to win that battle. Four straight downs. Nobody. you got to take a chance. You have some talent. You have Josiah Price. You have Donnie Corley. You have the opportunity. Do you not believe that your quarterback can get the ball to these guys? I, I You could have even tried even a, you know, a sneak, a quarterback sneak to try to move the ball forward. But to give the ball handed off was devastating, and it killed, I think, the momentum yeah, of the a, entire game. It a, killed the momentum. It's a season of futility. Of they, It's, again, it's just like the, the Lions, that they're the smartest guys in the room that we're going to keep And Mark Antonio said it. Pride comes before the fall. And I think Michigan State was being prideful, that they thought they could line up and try to smash mouth football like they had done in years past. Years past! They could do it. And they were able to run the ball a little bit effectively in this game. They won the rushing total battle this game. They didn't end up winning the game, but pride came before the fall. You thought you could uh, line it up versus Michigan's defense and smash it in there. It didn't happen. Nobody thought you could do it. Pride definitely came before the fall. Now, before we get a little too deeper into this game, I, I want to ask you about the, the last series. So we score the touchdown, oh. and then you go out for the two-point conversion. I don't get it. It does. It, it doesn't make. I I I'd really like to know what Mark D'Antonio's thinking was. Now I, I get. I think what he said is that the game is essentially over. You can't advance an onside an onside kick recovery. So let's just go for two. I, that that logic it doesn't make sense in my brain because you if you miss it then you're down by seven. If you make just the regular extra point. Then you're down by six, which means all you got to do is if somehow, which we've seen in this series, somehow magic things happen, you could get a touchdown. Then all you got to do is kick an extra point and you've won the game. But instead, you try to go for a two-point conversion, which would you'd still need to get a touchdown to be up in this game. But instead, you run an option play that gets returned to the house by the... (laughs) The Heisman hopeful, who I think he is just getting overblown out of proportion, and now you're down by nine, and you are out of the game. You can't. There's yeah. There's only like two or three seconds left. Now you can't win the game at all. I just said whatever. I was like, seriously, this is what's happening. That the play was botched. It was horrible, and that's what they deserve. They deserve to be embarrassed and have Jabril Peppers run, uh, you know, free all the way to you know the other side to earn the two points. He he deserved it. Uh, Michigan State deserved it. Mark D'Antonio, Dave Warner didn't put the offense in the best position to win, 
and the defense just, you know, there was lack of toughness. The defense wasn't able to make the key big stop when needed. Michigan was able to do a lot of different things. I mean, going into the game, you didn't think that uh, Darbo was going to be a, a factor in this game. Boom, he gets a ton of catching yards. He has stats galore. Jabril Peppers was all over the field doing things. It just didn't seem like, you know, many of the players believed that they could do it. And even after the start that they had, once Michigan punched back, it just didn't seem like Michigan State believed that it was going to be their day. And uh, it was a sad time. And there was a, a great video by a friend of the podcast, Justin Rose, where he got to see where um, staffers from Michigan went into the state locker room and they got um, the Bunyan Trophy out of the locker room. It was such a, like a sad you know, a sad ending to the season that was. And it's just devastating. You know, in at Michigan State, you had a lot of yellow, just a ton of fans supporting Michigan. And I know that many fans wanted, many Michigan fans wanted Michigan to blow out Michigan State. It's good that they didn't lose by a ton. It's good that they were able to kind of stay in the game and do some of the things that they were known to do. But it's just so devastating knowing that I think the coaching let the team down. I think that if they were better coached, had better you know, if they if they had stuck with Tyler O'Connor, I feel like his confidence would have been up and he might have done a lot more things. But they just didn't have really, in essence, Jason, they didn't have enough horses to do the job. Michigan has a ton of talent and they performed. You know, I'm just not, I think there are, there are definitely issues on the coaching staff, particularly with Dave Warner in the offensive play calling. But you, it isn't all in the coaches this year. I think you, you look at the Lions and their situation, they have talent on on their team, but their coaching staff is killing them. The coaching staff, while they are making poor uh, play calls, I'm not sure if they have the talent. You know, they they you know, they went to the college football playoff last year. They lost a ton of guys, and now you're you're trying to just replace everybody. And I don't think you can, unless you're a super recruiting team like Alabama or Ohio State. It's really tough to replace guys like Connor Cook, guys like Shalik Calhoun, and we just lost a ton on our offense and defensive side. And then Michigan punched, you know, Michigan, Mich- Michigan State, uh, you know, Michigan State in the past few years had done a lot of punching. Michigan punched back quite a bit this year. Look what happened. Lewerke broke his leg, and he's now done for the year. You now waste an opportunity to use him going forward. They're saying at Michigan State that they're not going to um, mess with the red shirt of Messiah DeWeaver. So you're now counting on Damian Terry and Tyler O'Connor. It's, this, the it's, season's over. It's You're 2-6 and six right now. The only, I mean, I think you're looking at probably not even making a bowl game at this point. It's devastatingly you, you bad. You probably need to win the rest of your games, maybe besides Ohio State. And even then, you're probably looking at the outside looking in right now. So this, you, you pretty much just chalk this season up as a loss. Uh, I mean, after you lost those three games in a row, it was all, already pretty much a wash because where this program is, you really are looking at college football playoff. That is the goal of winning a Big Ten and then getting to a college football playoff. And that was pretty much eliminated a couple of weeks ago. So we were really just pl- playing for pride at this point to try and spoil our rivals. And we played admirably. And I think it's... I think it, it actually is, might affect Michigan in the long run because we were able to to get to them, and I think it's it's it. I don't know. I think, do you think they could have actually, if they would have poured it on, could they have put up uh you know fifty sixty points on us? You look at that as a concern in that uh, once you got up, maybe in the second half they weren't as you know ready to play and as motivated. But I think they knew going into the game, basically they just had to show up and not kill themselves. They made the one mistake with Spate in the interception. But other than that, they had the advantage, and I think if they would have you know, put the pedal to the metal, they would have dropped 50 points. But they were able to do what they wanted to do. And what is interesting, though, is the rapid decline in the season. Like, Michigan State has to find ways going forward because it's become a trend now where every couple years they have down years. You know, 2012 comes to mind. You have situations where... You can't have down years where you lose six straight games. You can't do that. So whether it be the recruiting classes from 2013, 2014 being not so great or overrated, but down years have to be like a couple losses. That's it. Mark D'Antonio now in his 10th year, this is not what anybody expected going into this season. 
And we all knew it was going to be a transition year, but we were all thinking 9-3, and 10-2. and two. Not this, not six straight losses, not a complete abomination of performance. And Mark D'Antonio week in, week out was coming out saying, well, we still have goals and things like that. It's start, it's starting to feel like the players don't believe in themselves and they don't have the leadership necessary to pick themselves up when some adversity hits. And it's really sad to see, especially when, you know, the train's coming. The, Jason, it's looking bad right now. I'm really happy that Michigan's going to lose about 20, 25 talented players coming off of this season. But everyone's looking at Michigan just reloading every year because people are starting to put Dan to, uh, people are starting to put Harbaugh in the class of Saban and Urban Meyer, where they can just roll in year in year out and have one and two lost years and not have. I don't see Michigan having a year where they lose six games under Harbaugh. You can't have that. I, I think it's too early to say that because we six won't... loss Michigan team with Harbaugh. I don't see it. I think it's possible, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if we could look at that next year. I think six losses is a little much. I think seven and five, eight and four is probably where you're going to look at uh, of Harbaugh's worst seasons. But if if any if it's going to happen any time, I think you would look at next season because they are losing pretty much everybody on their defense, and that's what's been keeping them in games and allowing them to be able to pretty much do whatever they want on offense. It wasn't as sad as we all thought, but it's still very sad that that uh, Michigan's now basically looked at as the uh, dominant team in the state of Michigan. It's devastating. Well, that's, sad. that's why we play every single season. Because I mean, if if it's why don't we just crown Michigan every game? Why don't we mm-hmm. crown them every year? Give it you know split back and forth between between them and Ohio State. That's why we play every year because sometimes it's going to happen. And I really think Michigan State is still going to hang around, and they're not going to win every year, but they're gonna they're gonna be able to compete in this Big Ten. Okay, the question that a lot of people were asking on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast is: Do you see, and should it be now time for Mark D'Antonio to evaluate this offense and evaluate the style of football that he's? you know, trying to run going forward. Because in the past, Jason, they've been a solid smash mouth team. And it got you to where, you know, it got the success, it got the program turned around, it got them to the college football playoff. But now you say when you got there versus Alabama, a solid team, you got your asses handed to you. Now coming back this year, you basically tried to do the same thing in terms of run the football, smash mouth, have a solid defense, but do you think maybe, just maybe, with the new crop of quarterbacks, Lewerke, Messiah DeWeaver, that maybe they look and take into account, okay, maybe you dismiss Warner, you reassign him, whatever politically nice thing you say to get him off of calling, calling the plays, but do you see them maybe going to a different style offense, maybe a more, you know, you know, more run and gun, more... Not this season. I just... Going forward, do, do they need th- to? They need to. I, I do think they do, because we had all those... All the recruits, all those big name running backs, the the Le'Veon Bells, the Jeremy Langfords, and LJ Scott and Gerald Holmes to a lesser extent. And now we have guys, we have we, we didn't have the wide receivers. We had a lot of wide receivers in the past. We had Plasco Burris, Charles Rogers, we had all those big name wide receivers. We were a passing team. Then we went to the running game, and now it, it seems like we're going back to towards the passing game. We have Donnie Corley. We have another great freshman who we haven't really seen in Cam Chambers. I think we have the weapons through the passing attack, and we need to use them. If we, if we, and we better do it by next season because if, Don, yeah, if, Donnie if Corley it, looks very. If it solid. doesn't change by next season, then Donnie Corley is definitely going to leave after next year. Mm, yeah, Donnie Corley, man. He, I he, mean, he may just leave after next year, anyways, but. To actually get any use out of them for Michigan State, we have to change. Yeah, I think the offense needs to be flushed and to redone a little bit. But it's it'll be nice to see how D'Antonio regroups because you got to remember that 2012 people said the same thing. Boom, you come back the next year and have a solid season. So I have confidence still that D'Antonio still has a solid grasp of the program and knows what he needs to do to win. But it's one of those things where after a decade – you might start asking, and I know people think it's blasphemous, but you might start asking, has the time come to maybe reevaluate at Michigan State and go for that big-time national guy? Now, whether it be in the likes of a Les Miles or someone that comes, I know some people are looking at uh, this P.J. Fleck out of Western. Does he take that next step to a Big Ten team, whether it be Purdue or some other, you know, some other team in the SEC or Big 12? 
but uh, it might be worth it out there to look at uh, what D'Antonio's doing because if he has another down year next year and you got the likes of Urban Meyer and you know Harbaugh there, it's going to be hard going forward to maintain consistency mm. in that Big Ten East. Who you know? Who said a couple of weeks ago? You know, maybe it's time to look at is D'Antonio at the peak. Who said that? That might have been you. I'm pretty sure I brought that up a couple of weeks yeah. ago, John. Yeah, you probably have. But uh, I, stealing so I, my takes. It's hard to uh, really it, take off the green and white glasses. I know right. you graduated from there. Yeah, take them I'm off. I'm a Sparty huh? fan too. I'm looking at it realistically. You, you're a fanatic. You, you always like to say it. Fan is short for fanatic. I'm fanatic. Take this off is. the green and white glasses and see it for what it really is. I love Mark D'Antonio, and I'm not saying it's over for him. But we really need to see changes. Uh, I definitely think next year he'll be looked at with a much more critical eye because, man, oh, man, you you had an opportunity this year to come back after making it to the college football playoff and really do some things. And uh, at, at the very least, you've you've lost supremacy in the state of Michigan, and that's going to hurt in recruiting. It's going to hurt going forward. But let's just hope that Michigan State can come back and still have some talented players and make plays next year and really have an opportunity to do some things because – my goodness, man, the tide could be turning greatly, and especially this year if Michigan does some things and gets to the college football playoff the next year and maybe gets that win versus Alabama. Oh, my goodness. Mm, the, the, I don't the, think about that. Much man, about the, that. The, the, <laughs> Slow your roll right there. All right, sir, let's get out of here. Anything you're looking forward to this weekend? Are you uh, on vacation? I'm on vacation. I'm going to be in Florida going to Disney World. Good for you, my man. Yep. Good, good. Get on vacation. Uh, enjoy yourself. Take a lot of pictures, and uh, we'll see what's going down. How's your fantasy team looking? Oh man, we're gonna after this we're gonna do like a little recording so I can I can give something to the fans. But yeah, I know my, my the team, experts never have the good teams. Seems my like. slack jaws my slack jaw league is I'm two and six in, and I actually went down because I I needed to figure out what went wrong. Am I really drafting so poorly, or is it as I've been saying all along the fantasy football is all luck. Mm. but you'll just have to listen to that episode when it comes out. Yes, sir. Thanks, everybody, for supporting us. Go to DetroitSportsPodcast.com for all the notes regarding the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Thank you for downloading, and definitely click those links regarding um, the podcast that we're doing for Detroit Mercy Titans. Definitely uh, Detroit's college basketball team doing some things under Bakari Alexander. Should be a fun season. For John Macaroon, I am Jason Jarvie. Follow me on Twitter, Jarvie the King. As he said, follow the Detroit Sports Podcast on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. Bye! Okay, nice idiot. Uh, f*** you. Bye-bye. Good day, sir. I said good day. All right. Take care now. Bye bye then. Hey, you, sir. <laughs> <laughs>